Chapter 4, Structured Cabling and Networking Elements, Part 1. Well, this ought to look really familiar to us by now. Here we are still with our TCP IP model. But whereas last week we were up here in layers 3 and 4 talking about things like TCP, UDP, and IP, and all that kind of stuff, this week we're down here in the weeds, if you will, down here in layers one and two, the hardware, the physical implementation of our network environments. So what governs this? How, do, how is there any standardization across industry at all, right? Why is building A not wired one way, and then right next door, a second building, set up completely differently and completely incompatibly? There's a new word for us, incompatibly. Well, it's because of this. There are industry uh, associations out there, trade associations, that have developed standards across the industry. TIA, which stands for the Telecommunication Industry Association, and EIA, Electronic Industries Alliance, have created standards, the 568 standard, which is also known as structured cabling. And this is just a method of implementing networks and cabling inside in, in, inside a structure right and it's also made up of best practices and uh, methods for doing it it defines certain terminology and it makes sure that everyone's on the same page when we're talking about this so there's some terms we, we need to look at <clears throat> and that's what the standard defines right so if this is a little map of our facility and we got a couple buildings going on over here. We have something called the demarcation zone, right? Or the entrance facility. This is where your network connectivity comes in from the outside world. This is the internet out over here somewhere. And at the line of demarcation is where it enters your area. And that's where it becomes your responsibility, right? This becomes our local area network, all of this. And we have some other terms here too. We have something called the MDF, the main distribution frame. And that's really nothing but the server room or closet in which the, 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 the main connection comes in from. For connecting our other buildings together, we would, have, we would connect them with backbones, right? So these are high capacity cables that would link our outlying buildings to our MDF. Inside of these buildings, we have what's called IDFs, the intermediate distribution frames. These are wiring closets. That's really all that is. And then from the wiring closet, it was just full of switches and patch panels and all that stuff. We'll look at it here in a minute. That's where we hook in our workstations to. So you can kind of see we have a star topology here, sort of. Right Here's the core of our network, and here's our branch pieces coming out from it. So again, we have our terminology. You will see the term IDF quite a bit. It means wiring closet. So what about a multi-story building, right? Well, we could totally have this. It's not uncommon for IT to be down in the basement. They don't let us have natural light. That's where we live. We, 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 we live in the dark. So our MDF, our server room, is quite likely down here on the first floor somewhere, down here in the basement. And then we have a backbone that goes up through the floors, straight up. And a lot of times this goes up elevator shafts or whatever. And off of each floor, here is where our workstations spawn from. So if this is the MDF, the main distribution frame, these are IDFs or wiring closets. So how does, what does it look like on every floor of our building? How, what does it look like from workstation all the way to the, to the wiring closet? So over here is cubicle land, all right? Here's where people's desks are. They got pictures of their kids and little stress balls and all that kind of stuff. There's a PC sitting on their desk or under it. Well, that PC has a network interface card in the back, a NIC. That's actually what part two of, of this week is, is studying the NIC. And we have a cable. And that cable is going to run from the NIC to a wall jack somewhere. This might be... In the in the cubicle, most likely it is. It could be right. It could be. It's not very far away. It's going to be less than 10 meters, right? So it's not a very long cable run. And then this jack is hardwired 
all the way back to the data closet, to the wiring closet. And it goes through some intermediate steps here. It goes through patch panels and all that. We're about to see that. But eventually, it connects to a switch, a Layer 2 device that, for our purposes right now, is simply a way of hooking PCs together. There's a lot more going on with a switch, and we'll cover that later. But for right now, it gives us a place to plug all our, all, all our workstations together. And I'm very likely going to have multiple switches inside my wiring closet. Well, notice how they're cross-connected here, right? But this, it means that all my devices are a part of the same network right here. So this allows me to scale out within, within my work areas. Let's zoom in a little bit more on actually what's going on inside the wiring closet, right? Here's what we were looking at before, cubicle land, pictures of the kids, stress balls, workstation, patch cable going to a wall outlet, and then hard cabling. Now this is just like the electrical cabling in a building, right? This stuff's pretty permanent. Inside the walls, all the way back into the wiring closet. Well, it's going to come out of something called, a, it's going to come out of the wall and get put in something called a punch down block. It's a little piece of plastic with a bunch of metal teeth inside of it, and the cables are punched down right here. This is where the, the cable from the wall outlet terminates. And then there's going to be another cable that connects the wall cable from the punch down block to the actual rack right here, the equipment rack. And this is the, this is the frames that we put our equipment into. And it's going to be something in there called a patch panel. And actually, it's going to be punched down, again, on the back of here. And it's going to have a little label on it, probably like, you know, cubicle one, room four, whatever. And then from the patch panel, the cable goes, and there's another cable that connects it to our network switch. All right? Here's where we're actually getting into our layer two stuff right now, the network switch. And then from there, a cable goes and runs us all the way back to our MDF or our server room. So, there's a lot going on inside our, in, inside, our, inside our our wiring closets. A lot of cable, and I'm serious, there is actually quite a bit of cable. So this concept of cable management becomes really important. What is cable management? Well, it means making sure that my cable is neat, that I can find it, that I can track it, uh, because that we do have layer one problems sometimes. Sometimes cables do fail. Right? Sometimes the terminators fail on them. Uh, I've seen mice eat the insulation off them before because these things are running through the wall. And if, if, if I don't have good management, if I can't keep track of what cable is what and where it goes, then I'm going to have a very difficult time troubleshooting problems when they come up. Cable management also has things like making sure that our network cables don't run alongside electrical cables. Right, the stuff that's, that's providing power to our, to our rooms. Why? EMI, electromagnetic interference. Elect ele electric cables have electricity going through them. They generate a magnetic field around them. Well, if I run a network cable right across that, it's inside the magnetic field, and it's going to create static on my network lines, which will interfere with my network communication. It's another thing, making sure that my cables are the right lengths. Uh, making sure they're properly terminated. Making sure that I'm, I'm using cable trays and other accessories to enable me to manage my cables properly. If your organization is big enough, and actually this applies to any size organization, but it's more common in larger ones, you're probably going to have a company standard on what you're going to do for cabling. And this also includes things like colors, right? Color coding my cables. We do this all the time. I might have network cables, a Cat 5e cable that's used for VoIP phones, for voice communications, blue. And then I might have my data cables going to my workstations, yellow. And my stuff for my video conferencing, pink or whatever. The idea being, if I use a consistent color code, I can, I, wherever I see that cable, I know what it's for. Oh, look, there's a yellow cable that's for network communication, right? It all comes down to making it easier when you're trying to fix problems. Another big part of this, documentation. And this is usually one of the most neglected parts of not just cable management, but IT operations as a whole. Thing is, 
you're going to be lucky to remember what you did last week. Not mentioned six months ago, right? IT people tend to be very, very, very busy. So keeping documentation, keeping records of what connects to what and what color means what and so forth is key to be able to solve problems because when, it, when problems happen, they happen like 2.30 in the morning on a Saturday and everyone's having a meltdown about it. So you don't need to be reinventing the wheel and rediscovering fire in order to try to fix the problem. You want to be able to have documentation you can go to and reference, right? You want your cabled environments to look like this. This is what you strive for, right? Notice color-coded. There's some consistency here. Everything's properly sized, but there's a little bit of slack in it. Uh, I'm using tie-down straps, cable management trays. You want to be like this. Don't be like this. And that's a real example right here. And amazingly, it's more common than you'd think. These little details like documentation and cable management, they're the first things that go when people get busy, when things, when, 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 when the, the, the rubber hits the road. It gets neglected. Like, oh, we don't have time to figure out where this cable runs, so I'm just going to run a new one, get it going, problem fixed, oh, next emergency, and you forget all about the first one. Well, over time, you're going to end up with something that looks like this, right? A nightmare to try to manage. This. Not this. Yes. No. All right, device management. In order, not only do we want to keep records of what our network cables go, but we also want to keep track of our network devices, right? Our servers, our computers, our switches, all this stuff. What makes are they? What models? What versions of operating systems are they running? And not only do I want to do that, but I want to keep them up to date. Obsolete records, out-of-date documentation is almost, not quite, but almost as useless as having no documentation whatsoever. Yes, it takes work. It takes effort. However, when things go bad and you're trying to fix a problem, it'll make your troubleshooting so much easier. As an IT person, you're going to love labeling, right? You're going to have a label maker and you're going to go to town. You're going to be labeling everything. It's really a good idea. We want to label our cables. We want to label our switch ports. We want to label patch panels. You want to label wall jacks. If there's any doubt whether I should label this, the answer is yes, put a label on it. Now, there's some, there's some guidelines to this. Organizationally, you're going to need to decide on a naming convention, right? You want to be consistent. And it doesn't matter what this is, but you want to be, pick something and apply it throughout your organization. Right? Consistency is key. Look at what I might have here in the back of a Cisco router. Right? Here are various slots and ports. And here I am, my little label maker. Oh, this port goes to IT. This one goes to the sales department. This one goes to HR. All that. And it's going to seem silly. You're like, really? I think I can remember this? No, don't. Label it. It's going to make it easier for you. It's going to make it easier for your IT staff. So rack systems, what does our network equipment even go into, right? Well, they go into racks, pieces of equipment that look like this. And they're really just shelves designed to hold our stuff, but they do it in a, in a, in a particular manner and for a specific purpose. In our server room, we're probably going to see racks that look like this, right? These are actually cabinets. Uh, I can get these without any walls on them whatsoever, and what we see here. And there's rails that go up and down the front and the back, and they're actually numbered, right? These are what we call standard 42U racks, U meaning unit. A unit is about an inch and a quarter. And I have standardized holes, so all my server manufacturers, all my network manufacturers, Cisco and Terrasys, all that, they make their mounting hardware compatible with these racks, right? And... Basically, what I, I just rack and stack, figure out where I'm going to put it and hook it up. In our wiring closets, we're probably going to see something that looks more like this. These two post jobs. And they usually screw right into the floor, right? Most of the time, your wiring closets have concrete floors in them. And our network equipment is way lighter than our server equipment. Patch panels weigh hardly anything. Even switches are 
light compared to other pieces of network equipment or other server equipment. So I can totally get by with doing having just two posts on here. The rack, the mounting hardware is a bit different, but it's designed for it. And notice what we got going on here: cable management. Notice the cable trays, right, and the cable runs. I can see a little bundle of cable here going into the floor somewhere. That's what we want our wiring closets to look like, right? And this is big. I mean, this would be a big wiring closet. Some, a lot of times, it's literally a closet, the size of a coat closet, and you'd have like one of these inside of it, right? That would be an IDF closet. Larger ones, you can you, obviously you can stack them up. Now, one thing we have to worry about, especially in our server rooms, is airflow. And it has to do with heat. Servers, storage arrays, even network equipment, switches, but to a much lesser degree, produce heat, right? Well, electronics hate heat. They burn up. They burst into flame. Bad. So a, lot, a big part of our server infrastructure is keeping all this cool. Right? And we do it with, with these giant air conditions called crack units. We'll look at those later on. But we have to consider heat dissipation in our overall design of our server room. So we lay up our racks. These are aisles of racks. right? And we'll have what's called hot rows and cold rows. The cold rows, basically where the air conditioning blows up through the floor, fans inside the rack suck the cold air in, and then they blow the hot air out the back. So in my hot rows, I'm going to have some type of heat dissipation, some type of maybe some type of suction up here in the ceiling that's driving everything up and getting it out of there. And on my cold rows, I'm going to have, well, it's probably going to be a floor tile, because these are all raised uh, floors. They're about a foot off the ground underneath them. I'm probably going to have a floor tile with a bunch of holes in it, right? And a bunch of cold air will be blowing up through it. In case you not, haven't got the idea yet, server rooms are not very pleasant places to be in, not for human beings. They tend to be cold, right? They're loud because there's a lot of uh, air moving around, not to mention the, sound, the, the fans and the sound of the equipment itself. And just not really very comfy. That's why we do most of our administration from the comfort of our own desk. Right? We try to stay out of here as much as possible. Other things I might see inside my server room. Right? We talked about... Um, servers. Well, we have what's called network appliances or IT appliances. And I'm not talking about refrigerators or toasters. I'm talking about a specialized server that does like one job. And one very common one we're going to see is called a NAS, Network Attached Storage. Now, you very well might have one of these at home, right? I can get a home NAS unit for a couple hundred bucks. And really all it does, it centralizes my storage. So it's just a bunch of disks really, and it's making the files available over the network. In a future chapter, we're going to really deep dive more into NAS, but keep in mind that the, for right now that this is just a piece of network equipment that will probably live in one of your racks here, and it could be anything from a little 1U pizza box, like this server right here, to a piece of equipment the size of the entire rack, or maybe multiple racks. It could be tiny, it could be big. Related to the NAS, but not but different, is something called a SAN. A SAN is a storage area network. And what it really means is a separate network just for accessing my disk. Right? It looks something kind of like this. So I might have a big storage array. And this is really a box of disk. And these things can scale massively. You can have some of these get approaching the petabyte size when you're talking about disk storage. Price tag on these guys can go anywhere from a few thousand dollars for low end, almost uh, almost home use, not not quite, but really small small medium business type stuff, all the way up to multi multi million dollar appliances. Ultimately, though, the the storage unit on a SAN, the storage array, is nothing but a server specialized to hold disks and make storage available. Well, to attach to that server, I could have a dedicated network. This is not my local area network for network communications. This is a network that could operate in parallel. right? So maybe I have servers that my clients attach to, my, my workstations out here in cubicle land, and 
the server is attached to the storage array through the storage area network, right? Client, this is LAN, this is SAN. It used to be SANs were purely in the realm of big business, right? Government, cause everything, because they were so expensive. Nowadays, though, you know, you can get into a SAN for a few grand. So this technology is way more accessible now than it was even just 10 years ago. So you can expect to see it, and it's going to take up a space in your server room. Well, all this equipment in our server rooms, all these SANs and NASs and switches and stuff, well, they, take, they require power, right? Power is a really big deal to us. For one, we need to make sure we have enough of it going to our server room. I'm not kidding. I've actually been hired by, as it, when I was consulting, been hired by a company to install some server. And they go out and they spend eight, ten thousand dollars for the server, get it in. I'd be bop out there to the site to go install it, go to their server room and find out they have no place to plug it in. They've used all their power sources. <sighs> Doesn't that make them mad? Now they got to do a power upgrade. Well, you don't want that to happen. So you need to be keep track of your power environment, right? I also need to make sure that my power is safe. Power surges are a really bad thing for network equipment, for our server room equipment. It can fry everything from your home computers, your home NAS units, all the way up to those multi-million dollar uh, storage area networks. Yeah. So we need to be able to protect that. We need to understand how to prevent power surges. How do we implement surge suppressors? Uh, UPSs, on our uninterruptible power supplies. Power outages happen all the time. IT equipment hates having the power ripped out from under it. So you have to have a plan. How am I going to do this? How am I going to manage surges? How am I going to manage power outages? It actually requires a fairly good amount of knowledge of electricity. Right? A lot of data center managers, and these aren't necessarily IT people, but the people that manage the data centers, come from electrician backgrounds. Right? or HVAC backgrounds, because it plays such a large role in these environments. We have different kind of power flaws we have to look out for. We talked about the surges, right? But what about a blackout? That's when power goes out completely and stays down. Well, that's bad. That's not something we definitely want to avoid, but not nearly as bad as a brownout. Right? This kills equipment. This is where power starts to drop, and then it comes back. Drops a little, comes back. Drops a little, comes back. And your, and your machines are just bouncing, right? They're, they're freaking out. They're, they're very likely going to fry something. You're probably going to lose disk, uh, your power supplies. It could turn into a really big deal. But ups, and I'm, I'm not talking about the uh, uh, United Parcel Service, the ice cream truck for grown-ups. I'm talking about an uninter uninterruptible power supply. This goes a long way towards avoiding those kind of problems, of avoiding brownouts and blackouts and all that. We use them at home, right? We, you, you might have them in your office space that ups under the desk to help protect the to help protect the workstation. In those kind of cases, it's not really so much to uh, prevent a power outage. It's to prevent the system from being slammed by brownouts and, and surges and all that kind of stuff. It's just there for protection. Right. Upses comes in all different kinds of shapes, sizes, and flavors, and we'll look at that in a future week. They can be anything from a little tiny unit about the size of a shoebox that fits under your desk to a, something that takes up the entire room of a factory floor, right? Full of car batteries. I've walked into ups rooms that you can feel your hair raise on up on your head and on your arms because it's this, this, this such a such a charge in the room what do I which one do you need well it depends on your environment depends on your scalability depends on your budget ups are great but they're nothing but batteries really they're there to protect the fragrance from the surges and the brownouts what if power goes down and it stays down like hard, like for days, which can sometimes happen, especially during ice storms up here in New England. Well, I have to keep my, I, if my server room is down, my IT infrastructure is down, and my business isn't in business. I'm down. 
Well, one thing we can use make use of is a generator. Right? And a generator is just a backup power source, and it's hooked to some kind of fuel source. Now, usually in these cases, they're diesel generators, quite frankly, quite, quite, quite commonly. And what happens is they sit there and they wait for the power to go down. So you've got a server room, and it, you're hooked up to your to the central main power, to CMP. Power's coming in. Everything's running. You know, happy day. And then, bam, power goes down. Somebody hits a pole outside your building. First thing that will happen is the UPS, the uninterruptible power supply, will all will cut in with its batteries and keep everything up and running. Right? So I'm... Um, Inside my building, inside my server room at least, I'm not even going to know that happened except I might see some alarms go off. Now the UPS is battery powered, so it's only going to be able to keep stuff up for a very short period of time until those batteries uh, run out. That's where the generator comes in. Usually the generator is, is connected in such a way that when it detects that power is out and the UPS turned on, it starts itself. And especially an engine, right? It'll start, uh, it'll, it'll crank up, it'll start, it'll have to run for a few seconds to even everything out. But then once we have a steady source of power coming from the generator, then the power cuts over. And either, either it takes my upses offline or it just feeds the upses uh, in an in, in a inline manner. Either rate, the generator runs until commercial power comes back. Well, we said generators require fuel, diesel, propane, whatever. There's another job of your data center manager, your server room manager, making certain that the generator works. You have to test it regularly, some, in many cases weekly. And you got to make sure there's actually gas in the tank, right? We talked about how important temperature is inside, inside a server room. And it's huge. Uh, a large data center can go from 60 degrees with the HVAC systems on to 95 in a couple of minutes, maybe 10 minutes. It happens really fast. And my equipment does not need to be hot for very long before I start frying things. So we have monitoring equipment in our, in our data centers, in our server rooms, in some cases even in our wiring closets. And it checks for things like humidity and temperature and is the air flowing? A lot of times it'll check for flooding, right? I've seen a data center flood before, not pretty. Many times there's monitors on the floor to look for water on there. Data centers, well, you don't want to put them on the tour of your company and bring people in to have everybody in there looking at it. They should be locked and access to them should be tightly controlled, uh, ideally only to, IT, to the IT department, right? For all these various reasons, anything that messes up our HVAC or our our power or anything like that could be catastrophic to our line of business. So, we need to protect these things. And that concludes part one of our hardware lecture this week. When we come back, we're going to go up the stack a bit and take a look at what's happening at layer two and get a really close look and up close and personal with a network interface card.